Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the IDA Summit 2021. I am Goy Prakash. I am an architect. I have recently completed my master's in architecture and urban design. And today I will be guiding you throughout this engaging event. I hope you are all present in good health and are keeping safe at home. IDA Summit is an initiative by the Architects' Diary. It aims to bring a stir in architectural fraternity through insightful engagements with renowned and great minds in the field of architecture and design. Our sponsors for this event are Insulpro and Bromic Meetings. We thank them for believing in our vision. You can know more about Insulpro and Bromic Meetings from separate domes directly from our lobbies. Our state-of-the-art venue is designed by Manticore Designs. There are a lot of challenges at hand for architects throughout the world, mainly because we are operating during such odd times. Everything is rethought upon and has gotten a different paradigm. We need to locate the crux of any challenge to be able to solve it, or maybe give an attempt to change certain things in the architectural world. This year's theme for IDA Summit, as you all know, is the, the foyer to future. Is the future in the hands of technological advancements? Where is the sustainability factor going? Are urban cities turning into small village pockets which are well connected? What is the role of an architect in the field? And will there be a need for an architect in, say, 2040? All of these questions and many more are brewing in our minds. And through this event, you will be able to address these questions as well as get a much refined perspective. Throughout today's event, you will be able to attend several speaking sessions, panel discussions, and workshops. Please note a few things about our state-of-the-art venue. You can switch between Auditorium 1 and Auditorium 2 whenever you want. You can download the schedule for both days from either of the auditoriums. During the last few minutes of any session end, you can send in your questions and we would ask the speaker to answer them on your behalf. If you are attending the Rhino Basics workshop, please download the software link, which you might have received in your registered email. It is not mandatory. Please open the screen on a laptop for best results. You can converse with each other via network lounge during break or otherwise. So today I welcome our first speaker, architect Yatin Pandya from Footprints of Earth. Architect Yatin Pandya is an author, academician, researcher, as well as a practicing architect with his firm Footprints Earth. He is a graduate of SEF University, Ahmedabad, and has a wheeled Master's of Architecture degree from McGill University, Montreal. Architect Yatin Pandya has been involved with city planning, urban design, mass housing, architecture, interior design, product design, as well as conservation architect, uh, projects. He has won over 38 national and international awards for architectural design, research, as well as dissemination. The most recent ones have been the United Nations Habitat Award, Special Mention, and the United States Curry Stone Foundation Design Prize for Sustainable Practice. He has written over 300 art articles in national and international journals. Several books authored by him on architecture, especially concepts of space in traditional Indian architecture and elements of space making have been published internationally. He has also been involved in preparing over 30 video documentaries on architecture. He has been visiting the faculty of National Institute of Design and SET University and guest lecturer and critic to various universities of India and abroad. He has served as a thesis guide to nearly 300 graduate, masters, and PhD students. He has lectured in over 15 countries in over 100 fora. Environmental sustainability, socio-cultural appropriateness, timeless aesthetics, and economic affordability are key principles of his work. Now I would hand over the screen to our architect Yatin Pandya to start his presentation. Thank you. Namaskar. Very good morning. It's good to at least connect through this virtual medium because we all know last year and a half have been tricky, but I hope you are all safe and sound and let's think positive and move forward to rethink, pause and reshape our built environment. So what I hope to share with you, it's not really preaching, but just that what has pandemic taught us and with 
that as a kind of a pause point or a point to ponder how do we look at our future in terms of what kind of path of development should we be taking up and our goal of course is to create timeless human and sustainable built environment sustainable habitat and my bias has always been that inspire from yesterday and aspire for tomorrow when we talk about yesterday tomorrow as you can see that uh, 100 years apart have we really grown have we progressed have we kind of uh, you know broken what kind of grounds uh, and which is what we need to see when we talk of technology has that changed the human uh, behavior human mindset or what i mean so it's just to check right now we are not kind of taking any value judgment but uh, what 100 years apart have we uh, come to two generations apart so it's just to take this as an opportunity to think on our path of development where you know this pandemic can i believe it's become a little easier because we all experience the meaning of some of those uh, arguments or some of those ideas or thoughts that was being put across that nature has very 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 loudly told us that we are only a subsystem of a larger arrangement so we are a microcosm of the cosmos where as human being through technology what we were trying to do was to become a supreme and master the nature and this has basically humbled us what pandemic has taught us is humility it has been a great equalizer from cross nation across religion across powers across political ideologies as you know every way it's been to all and every so equality plurality frugality we understood the meaning of essential or the excess and of course sustainability and that's the point we understood the value of that uh, you know we always had given up that oh we are too many people planet cannot handle uh, itself or we cannot do anything about it it's already gone same number of people on this planet but under the pandemic we saw that just the undue system being kind of uh, absent we had given earth a chance to rejuvenate and earth did it on its own the air quality in delhi changed phenomenally every other area the visibility the uh, corrections in the water quality and even the flora fauna could now invade the territories that they never dared to so how do we turn this into calamity or constraint into virtue so that has taught, taught us two things that what has been the constant or the most sustainable tenets of a holistic or a good development is that equation harmonious balance between human and human and human to nature and therefore if our development model can base on these sort of basic fundamental values it would not go either out of uh, you know existence or even out of fashion why nature and nature it's not in the romance we are saying but nature is a phenomenon because it is in the nature's nature it certain attributes that nature is uh, ever changing you know we saw in the pandemic that thanks to a window and looking out at the nature we never got bored it was constantly and therefore it didn't feel like a jail although we didn't step out of the house so ever changingness nature itself showed that it's a life uh, nature is a life nature is a sheer existence nature meaning outdoors uh, those who could step out little bit out of their wall understood that uh, phenomenon very well nature bringing us hope every day sun rises and new day new start it is omnipresence so it's for all it's reminder of a time may it be diurnal cycle or a seasonal cycle spontaneity and that's been one of the most uh, important virtue and especially for architecture that time and space combination how nature in terms of time nature in terms of whatever it is laid over the build becomes a constantly changing and unique kind of uh, expression every moment so it's a dynamic diversity 
that it is about and nature is basically what we uh, you know uh, kind of uh, engage with in terms of celebrations you know nature has also been the inspirer for human kind of even science knowledge and endeavors so we all know the culture craft taking inspiration architecture taking inspiration through that uh, but we have always been as innocent an architect as a child we have played architect as a child when we played with the castles of sand or uh, you know lego blocks or so but intuitively we understood the value of nature that sun can dry out the sand and therefore moist sand would work it can only work through molding and therefore the forms that come out are not walls but are solid kind of forms you could scoop out shake hands through the sand tunnel etc etc which means that we understood and we were humble to respect nature and work within that and then you could still create amazing things the thing or need of an art is that do we play a child as an architect while we played architect as a child what when we are talking about nature is not just the prakruti but nature in terms of nature of things what has been contextually the outcome because these are interspersed the climate uh, kind of informing the culture culture informing the daily routine then then the attire then the food then the kind of staple uh, diets resources as well as architecture so if you see that all over the planet clothing is uh, all different people and their features are different skin colors are different food uh, is different uh, and so is the local architecture but how are we doing today in the name of future in the name of globalization in the name of one world and you know just for the interest i put this name which innocently one would accept but this could have been a joke it could be shuffled here to there and it would still not matter however as a context there is a historic uh, kind of uh, you know date of their conception being very different the culture being different the climate being different and not just india all over the world the kind of uh, you know alphabetically you put the name and these are correct early addressed uh, as the fact goes but it all looks the same is that what are we talking about when we say technology and future so nothing to blame the term but it is to understand in what way are we applying and interpreting for example both of these are kerala we have to wonder which kerala is for us which jaipur is for tomorrow which kolkata makes sense for us uh, so it is in that light thankfully we need to kind of relook at what was then a decade since touted as a smart city we need to understand where is it a vision and where is it a slogan you know if these are the images of the official portals of smart cities that uh, kind of questions have our cities all along through civilization been dumb is tradition anti modernity in context of india is this the real face of new india that we really envisioning or the progress is misconstrued to be growth we are calling growth to be a progress so that's where we need to understand the context and therefore what a development model need to be we can see a traditional quarter rather today coming across as community neighborhood and living environment versus the crowd and the number game our development model has to include the inclusiveness is what we understood post pandemic or during pandemic uh, that there have been a huge deficit and there is a economic disparity and there needs to be thing for all you know urban as well as rural uh, you know rural uh, 50% of urban population even places like mumbai live in what is termed as a slum urban rural divide we are just expanding our cities to engulf whatever agricultural land in the periphery and this is getting seamless and ironically most places downtowns are tall and suburbs are low in our case suburbs are tall uh, you know uh, and downtowns tend to be low the rich and poor disparity the health and hygiene which also we understood that how these primary sectors 
have been more kind of critical uh, the literacy rate social equality discrimination nutrition now this is not to become pessimist this is only to accept that as a challenge and like gandhi and gandhi we are not using as a loose currency it's only to understand that with one idea of swaraj through self reliance he solved many problems you know he understood that untouchability goes because of the people who are cleaning behind us having to carry that for you and you're calling them untouchable so he entered through this kind of a, you know small threads and became a champion for safe sanitation affordable education economic empowerment through that rural upliftment through that gender equity and because of all that sort of social integration so charkha which could be used decently by a woman sitting in a house while cooking the food can in fact spin few yarns and then kind of uh, you know use it to uh, sort of uh, veil herself and kind of uh, secure her dignity or earn some money and not be the mohtaj of the machos and stuff like that so how many things through one single idiom was he able to bring about so what it tells us is that design is not about finding one answer to one question that right now it's a traffic problem and therefore as many flyovers and as many widening of the road i think we have to go to the root cause and ask why are there so many vehicles on the road itself and what are they doing are they doing cross country from factory to house or what you know and we saw that uh, same systems but uh, in pandemic there could be an alternative way of operating so we don't need to find one answer to one question it is about asking many questions finding many answers to each of these questions and then picking one answer that answers most to all questions so it's about discretion this is where we come in as professionals it's about adding values how do we add, add value through design and how do we choose a path which is appropriate out of several possibilities you know and therefore it's appropriateness there's nothing like good or bad it's always appropriate and inappropriate but appropriate to what to the given place and people so the context if that was the idea of a holistic development or a design how do we end up doing one question or one answer if a child is dirtying the attire while crawling around the floor we just bake the attire like a mop so he looks wearing a mop all the time uh, you know so this is too quick and too singular kind of an interpretation of the challenge of design the important thing therefore we need to ponder and again pandemic can teach us a lot uh, when we talked about frugality multi purposeness you know how we could overlap the resources how with little we could without really compromising still do things we became all very inventive use of space use of food use of all other resources that we had at our disposal and therefore we need to rethink our norms which come from the realities of the place and its people and therefore we need to be smart about adapting it rather than simply aping it uh, it's more a contextual adjustment rather than a big kind of uh, rocket science or so that what works the best under the circumstances for what effective yield and this is where you know this is to kind of still talk about emerging norms from the local context uh, and yet for the good quality of life or progress for example there was a study done in japan that uh, if these formal tight up set of kind of dressing was excused to top order executives and were allowed to wear casuals they would feel the same level of comfort with couple of degree warmer ac temperature so the wrong dressing was the culprit to unduly having to jack up the ac and that's why if mr mohanlal and all the uh, you know our Uh, citizens from the hot and humid climate if they are wearing the moon are they primitive or they are most appropriately dressed for that given context uh, we knew gandhi shashwat gandhi the eternal gandhi went to wrap and unwrap do we need that or we need gandhi to to a line of the fashion or the season when it's cool and when it's hot uh, and this is exactly what we are doing with our 
built architecture. You know, these two examples on the left is in Ahmedabad, 45 degrees, which it goes up to a south facade on the left and west facade on the right. And you can see the implication of west facade. This building has been repainted, but the slummy veil has been retained. And on the left hand side, it kind of not only what happens inside, but it is throwing glare opposite into the footpath and three degree recorded warmer temperature off the footpath. As against from where we picked up, it was a sustainable solution in a cold climate or in the kind of a sky component not being that high, they needed wet light to illuminate naturally and therefore the use of glass. But yet they had these bylaws and the norms. Uh, this is Montreal to your left or North India, to, uh, North America to your right. Uh, in Montreal, there was a kind of a norm that said that uh, whatever you do to your building, you have to ensure a performance-based standard saying and demanding you to show that you would not cover 50% of the public open space in terms of shadow of your building. And another one was that opposite footpath should at least get three hours of sunshine whatever on the day of the equinox, whatever you do. And as a result, you find that the traditionally the buildings have been, like this is uh, New York, have been kind of a wedding cake profile. So they kind of recede as they go up. So sun manages to penetrate down in the colder climate. So the point is that have we envisioned our development regulatory framework to be close to the culture and climate. In Ahmedabad, we had four feet balcony available and it encouraged people to come out and sleep. And that also four feet projection ensured the building was well protected from sun and rain. Now two feet projection and that also not allowed to have it as a kind of extendable floor or a terrace. And that is a regressive standard and that is also affecting physically the building in terms of sun and wind and climatically doesn't help. Uh, you know, even if you do a kind of a, uh, what you call wardrobe with that uh, massing, it is illegal. But if you put helicobon panels around, it's fine. I mean, that's the kind of uh, thing we are questioning, you know. So what are the kind of criteria we need to think of when we think of cities for future, the habitat for future, that it has to have this thing about caring and sharing. So it's not just an individual, but there is also individual identity within collective conformity, which in traditions of India, we already had so well. The real DNA was, of India was in terms of resilience, endurance, the pluralism, pluralism with the faith system, pluralism with the attire that the same six year sari can be worn differently, can look different on different bodies, etc. Food, the most, uh, you know, fam I mean, kind of a favorite uh, interpretation of mine, that Indian thali where you are the designer of your bite, even though the mass produced ingredients are given to you and you can design your bite. So every bite, despite the standard component, is a unique combination and two people eating the same uh, thali cannot share that experience because each person's sequence may be different, proportion may be different and combination of will be different. Yes, our favorite food, pizza, but uh, pizza, so this is because of the combination meal and architecture needs to think of these because so that it does not impose a single truth idea. It's a multiple truth and people can be involved into the game plan. So that's the pluralism we are talking about. We all love pizza, but in pizza, after exercising topping and cheese and crust type kind of choices, once cooked, every bite is the same experience. And you and the other person eating the same, we can share that experience alike. So that's a difference. We're not saying thali is one up. You can have Italian thali for that matter with risotto and the uh, kind of tiramisu and the salad and soup. But you should be allowed to have permutation and combination. That's the point. And with the same structure, there is infinite variety. If we say Gujarati food, I think we are doing insult to a lot many regional foods, uh, which are very different. Katiavadi to, uh, you know, Surat, no Jaman and so on and so forth. And same if we say Southern, we are doing the same. So 
with those kinds of uh, goal or thought processes if we look at the lessons or the kind of uh, uh, norms where do we pick up from so first nature in comforting the environment and as i say as an architect we are triply responsible what we create last beyond us i really building last beyond us what we create is therefore even mistakes would perpetuate so has to be uh, more responsible not only for now but for time to come second building industry accounts for 42% of energy and that's much higher than many other that we tend to blame and therefore we have to be equally responsible and third that whatever we do in terms of our own built creation alters the existing landscape and there also we have to be aware about its consequences so the point is not to venture in but be humble so humility rhymes with uh, kind of uh, sustainability and when we say humility it is just shading ego many preconceived notions let it emerge out of patient's history the treatment and the diagnosis rather than prefix that every third patient should be a corona patient because statistics say you know the what are there for the tenets of sustainability it's many starting with refuse you should be able to not have things which right now you think you don't need then reduce then recycle then reuse then restore and then regenerate so probably in that cycle we should be thinking about things about anything in life right and i always say sustainability is a phenomenon and not a formula to be emulated but uh, it's a phenomenon and that is basically coming out of the way of the life or it should be shaping the way of the life so what have been the lessons we learned from yesterday years where why i'm saying yesterday is not to turn the clock backward not to think the romance of past or not to say old was gold but simply on the performance basis the very fact that most of these came in non electricity time still if we think that they had comfort can we not learn those principles that even if you use air conditioner you could very very minutely i mean we can dilute the tonnages that you need and only selectively you might need so first land as a resource and we built uh, very compactly in early civilization even though there was a lot of land because land was a fertile resource you know this jataka illustration here says that as much gold you can spread is the amount of land you could own which means land was considered that precious at that point in time because it was a renewable resource with vegetation and therefore the first civilization we built compactly deep long houses three side shared and even in the medieval times for defense we built compactly but how are we doing now the resource of land the attitude of change or the mind uh, kind of uh, set change you can see on the right hand side that 40 acre 16 hectare united nations unesco recognized uh, settlement in croatia in former yugoslavia dubrovnik it's the same scale which housed several thousand families with all sustainability uh, that we know used to be the norm in the middle ages uh, because of somebody's attack you could be in siege and even locked within you should not go out of supply water everything but the same area superimposed over one another you can see that clover leaf intersection of express way also amounts to the same land it is simply a luxury of not having to slow down a vehicle from 100 kilometers an hour and we had answers right here in amdabad we know early morning a cow grazing ground the same space over time changes radically so there is vitality all through the day there is optimization of space there is frugality of resource and yet without any compromise and it's the right thing at the right, at the right time change the mood uh, you know see the change of mood so afternoon it's a business district and same in the evening is outdoor eatery and i mean there is a video documentary but uh, how radically it transforms from a singing devotional songs in the morning as prabhat theri early morning 536 then the cowherd brings in a urban plaza with the paved kind of a hard surface 
he brings the cow he brings his hay you buy from him the hay so he is cash rich you feed the, his own cow that hay under the auspices of becoming little more less sinful his cows are happy and you think you've done something benevolent you are happy so most sustainable activity then gradually depending on what and the cow herd has to clean his space otherwise he would not be allowed next time so he also uh, takes privilege but he also knows his duty then during the early morning hours the sort of uh, water and the other kind of daily ritual because water only is there for hour in the morning so daily chores begin children play before their time of the school then the formal things from clothes to goldsmith and the merchants as well as informal no right of entry reserved it's plural for all to participate no obligation to buy just your being there the chemistry changes coexistence of vehicle and pedestrian nearly 500 vehicle find their place here and as i said everybody has a right to be part of it and dynamically constantly changing life and so on. when the shops uh, close their event their activity by about 8:30 or 9 depending on season that becomes a changed backdrop you don't accept that jail like backdrop so here it says madrasi cafe everything for us for to size madras sorry no insult to south and now we become global so it says marek pizza maybe this pizza italians eat they might commit suicide but that's our globalization so with all senses you can be part of it and your being there changes the mood and the complexion and uh, this is happening all in one day and every day next day the same cycle starts so we don't have five times the open space but one space can be multiply applied five times in different time of the day itself uh, and for a very radically different mood so that's the kind of lesson we need to pick up for optimization of land rather than sprawling and going all over land is a renewable resource and again none other than corbusier totters as you see it's manorama sarabhai house and nobody uh, unless you see the left hand side can imagine that these pictures are of ground first and the second floor of the existing structure which now is 70 year old uh, you know then uh, same way vertical greening the time which uh, did not even have the sustainability as a fashion word so these were all common sensible things to do traditional principles for insulation uh, uh, through masses and masses we don't need today to have a thick volume it has to have a volume and not a plane but you could fold the wall turn it into a storage and you could still get the insulation both in cold and hot climate but insulation need to in our context go with ventilation when we seal it with the glass like bangalore might be 24 degree outside but in a hotel if it's a fixed glazing you need to run ac inside to get 24 instead if you are able to have a window open it will be naturally because there is no ventilation and it just goes on accumulating heat so multi tiered roof to just evacuate the hot air out because of convective principle it's on top then uh, venturi effect to increase the velocity so jali and uh, lori baker taught us that even in contemporary aesthetics how well it can be applied with local material jali we knew traditionally was used which was culturally sound because of one way privacy venturi effect to increase the velocity and even bernoulli's principle that it goes from a small aperture and then releases so it micro cools itself uh, you know roof and outdoor spaces are living spaces so you don't have to overbuild today every school wants 1200 student auditorium could we not have cultural evening in the late evening because city of amdavad doesn't have a single auditorium of 1200 capacity vertical versus low rise this is just simply there's a whole argument researched and by i'm saying this that 2.7 fsi is what poor house achieves and this simulation on right top shows both of them have the same density one like poor has terraces and five story structure with better built form and interspersed open space versus the same density we get with 11 or such stories so climate kind of mitigation but upper floor projecting out so when sun is overhead the entire facade is in the shade when sun goes low next building start shading it courtyard uh, 
that in, is a genesis. I, my next book is on courtyard houses, but it's not about the book. What I what we realize is that even Leh to uh, here, Kanyakumari and east to west, it's a genus. I mean, uh, kind of a DNA of our own Indian traditional homes, uh, and that also uh, sort of a tool for harvesting water with takas. Mass production, we are not against technology and mass production, but what we need to understand that it doesn't become banal. Like here, a craft-based mass production, like kit of parts, like thali components, all ingredients were prepared, but you could permute and combine it, becomes your unique house. So there was no monotony. There were variations to each for personalization, and yet there was a harmony amongst it multiple use of space, morning, afternoon, evening, and also the festivities. And as I say, it was a way of life. So the swing, what fenders with mechanical energy before electricity, that is what was being done with the swing. And just as a naive thumb rule, warmer the place, spicier the pa uh, palate, so that you perspire and your body comfort, you get through evaporative principles, you know. So with those as the underpinning things, even for the physical environment and with least energy. So first step first, uh, you know, we rely on five star AC rather than can we not first create the least dependence on AC in severe time. If you need it for a couple of hours, then go to AC. So first thing is the design, the concern that translating into the design resolution, then the ways of life after that the kind of props and accessories. And then last is the gadgetry. You know. So accessories also window for that matter, a type of window, lured window allows for southwesterly breeze, but not the sun and the glare. So with this idea, let me just run through few interventions through design at different scales within the urban fabric uh, to largely. So how does it improve or change the quality of life? That's the thing. You know, so first, this one is uh, was recognized by United Nations. It was applied to several hundred homes in Ahmedabad and then carried forward by Seva Mahila Housing Group uh, to the other states, uh, you know, like Bhopal or so. Uh, here, this is what we have done before this Philippines clipping came in also. But this was not giving ventilation. You know, the empty water bottle, nobody gives you five PSA4, can become a very beautiful tool for illuminating because in a slum you have three sides shared by the neighbor but unlike our poor houses it does not have courtyard so last room is invariably pitch dark as well as extremely warm so even in the afternoon you have to run tube light or you have to also have fan to cool it off so what can we do for that so eventually we came down to this very affordable and sort of uh, simply replaceable over the existing corrugated sheets, whether of cement or of the galvanized iron, this dormer in a uh, translucent uh, fibrous uh, plast. And that allowed for cross ventilation and escape of hot air, as well as gave you the diffused light. And all pictures you see are the life with natural light condition. And that has recorded kind of one year post-occupancy result of uh, 150 rupee minimum, 150 to 350 range electricity bill saving for the same annual consumption after the installation per month per house. Then about 1500 additional income increase to their home-based economy because they could work for longer hours with letters, lesser strain on the eye. It became a health improver indicator. Uh, it became a kind of instrument in improving the education index because kids could stay home and work as well as it became a status symbol like So a very small you know, intervention like an installation, but it could magnified over the settlements can mean a huge difference to ecology as well as urban energy consumption and the quality of life. Slums won't become a, won't remain a slum with no little extra investment, you know. Then this is about interiors. So even inside, this is what, uh, uh, you know, uh, was uh, also uh, in the award for a, 
uh, you know, internal energy efficient uh, interiors. Uh, forget the design, common sense principle of everybody getting uh, the natural light uh, as far as possible with the comfort condition outdoors. You use the windows and yet when you need, you have an air conditioning, nature inspired detailing, undue glares have been shut out because we have a good sky component and promoting natural craft into the interactive environment and the nature in one form or the other remaining to give it a humane kind of a quality. And it is the client's own kind of uh, feedback that the electricity bill was 50% after this. And I only would believe them because then they asked us for five other extensions. So this is just a residence. Uh, it's not just a residence. Of course, it's a rich person's residence, but even in that, uh, using these principles is not it's these principles are not just for dukhi architecture so let less maintenance exposed kind of material uh, locally is uh, you know sal uh, got uh, then water harvesting and recycling in the you know underground pond in the courtyard courtyard in contemporary means uh, water and vegetation for microclimate natural daylight for most of the time of the day like this is a formal drawing room that is a courtyard which has been you'll see kind of covered in a way that light and ventilation is not affected and there's no false ceiling like there's a sunken part and then there is you can see a raised ceiling in the architecture itself so that raised ceiling on top becomes a kind of a seating for family you just put a foot on so you get your volumes without any false kind of uh, ceiling etc and ample daylight, good views. This is how ventilation has light and monkey and dust have been and thief have been taken care of. No chimney in the house. This is a skylight where the smoke kind of uh, escapes out and you get nice diffuse daylight. Uh, and even the dynamics of light, you know, ferro cement roof and the slit window. So the glowing morning and the evening setting sun can uh, invite you uh, with the day or pronounced daybreak and day end. And the overhead sun, this is in the double height dining area. So as the sun moves, it can move around. Uh, this is uh, giving some patronage to the local craftsmen. And these are unique designs. They look similar, but each design is unique. And just day before yesterday, even after lockdown, the third or the fourth project, I introduced them for a uh, you know, some uh, work and that's how they continue to do this craft. So they are very beautiful, but without our patronage, they will die. So different and yet, uh, you know, digital craft, art or the technology is not denied. So all energy saving uh, bulb or strategies, etc. are there. Then a standalone commercial building where uh, this one, you can see the only thing uh, I want to highlight about is that it is the orientation they were facing determined the face of the uh, the facade of the building, you know. So apart from the planning and less circulation, whatever, whatever. But uh, you can see on the left hand side is a stair shaft and it is like a contemporary jali. It's a crossword puzzle because this was a publishing uh, printing house once upon a time, etc. Uh, office for them. The middle one is the south one where the holes are smaller, the apertures are many and of course here it's inspired from the heritage of Amdupat. So the contemporary laser cut jali but thickness of the material and this hole maintained and the southwest as I said is a contradiction so of outdoor operable louvers so that you allow for the breeze but you don't uh, allow for the glare and the haze of the sun and this owner uh, kind of wealthy owner and not you have taken liberty to glaze it up. And of course, there is a vegetation and these are things from inside again with interactive. The owner said that till February, he doesn't use even the fen. Till about April, he uses the fen. And May and June, if the client comes for that one hour, he uses the air conditioner. So client doesn't think that he's a penny wise, a pincher Amdavadi. Then the institute, but approach is to salvage the waste material and put it here. So, for example, this is the Amtabad alone produces uh, 3000 metric ton waste a day. And we saw 
it being dumped and we created Everest of Kachra. Now it's being simply transferred somewhere else. This was our uh, effort that time. Three, hour, three years of hard research in understanding the waste dynamics, which one to uh, take up for conversion and what kind of value addition. So what kind of uh, effective translation. So after all that, we turn the different kinds of walling options. You know, one is from the fly ash, then the waste residue, then from the dump fill site. 75 pesa brick can be produced from the waste of the dump fill site. Uh, soil block with 5% cement, uh, the wooden crate. Crate is expensive, but that being brittle, once you put the nail, it's chipped off and therefore used for burning. But like we don't nail the glass, here also it was put with beading. We know that in a dry state, how many liquor bottles can be found easily. In fact, we did a kind of a you know sanitation park uh, in the government Paryavaran Bhavan compound, CGO complex, and we in fact exported liquor bottles from Ahmedabad to Delhi because we knew the source to get it from. So this is a uh, you know a western side sun. No overhang can cut down. So the uh, sort of bottle stained glass can give you the glow, but also cut down on the glare and the jolly like thing. So it allows for the breeze and it's not a Dukhi architecture. This could be very easily put up in a, uh, even the rich pieces, farmhouses for that matter or institutions. Uh, 1500 bottles every second get thrown in USA and when you're a party, we are not behind. And the same bottle, nobody gives you five pesa, despite very high tradition of recycling in India. We had uh, widows of the settlement in the evening in a cool environment, singing bhajan with simple thumb pressure, filling it with inert material like fly ash or soil, turned it into equivalent of two, two and a half rupee brick in the wall. This is wooden crate window, the kind of uh, fiberglass uh, used as a paneling, rag uh, sandwiched paneling, you know, oil tin container opened up to become door shutter panel or crate wood panel or that fiber uh, panel with the shavings, ventilator, louvers uh, and scrap. This is an interactive door for a crash uh, with all the salvage material. So it was a spontaneous design based on what kind of waste we had. So there was some cycle part, not a full cycle and that's how it was done. Same way the waste coming from the building construction site. You have to pay money to offload. Here we used it as a waste. Suppose I wanted one extra black stone, it was not available. So this is not showing the best design that should be produced, but it is just simply showing that whatever waste that you had could be turned into a so-called designed floor or whatnot. The kind of filler slab idea with local skills, filler with digital waste as well as the DIA as a kind of a you know thing too and it was a crash so it the kids used to be sleep and used to sleep and then look up so it was a little garish ceiling in that sense digital uh, ways for paneling etc so this is the crash this is the classroom these trusses look big but trust me that is a kind of a old time uh, that kind of a metal electrical piping and this is much lighter than one uh, you know, kind of MS section that you put uh, the local craft again. And the spaces are used multiply again. So morning you have this as a classroom, as you can see, very intensely used. Afternoon it is for the digital literacy of the young girls. So even though in slum, they are not behind for employability. Then best intensity festivals I've seen celebrated here, so it becomes a community space as well. Okay, and all medical camp, other things get run there. For a more formal kind of a, a greenfield uh, development for institute, uh, idea of land as a resource uh, through cut and fill, so material resource, no import or export of soil to raise the level. Then land uh, management with staggered kind of checkered board planning, so you create spaces in between like court or so, which can become an outdoor living room like this, uh, like this. Then land is a renewable resource. Before planting the first brick, the kind of fruiting and the yield-based trees were put, which were grown taller than the building. It took two years to complete. It's still going on over 15 years with 
new extensions. Uh, cut and fill gave also environmental uh, or the heat kind of augmentation because this raised mound became the earth mound to uh, insulate uh, the subterranean spaces. Then learning from traditional architecture, the upper flow growing, projecting out. So the buildings are in the shade. And northeast is the daytime use area and southwest is the evening time. Southwest is taller, northeast is sunken. And in terms of construction, roof is a ferro cement, which reduces less of steel and cement, although it uses both. And the wall is a ventilated cavity construction with external face as a exposed brick. So you don't need to, I mean, often plaster or never plaster and often paint. Uh, it just needs one repellent. Uh, and internal cavity can be used for services like downtake pipes, or it could be also good insulative barrier with, again, the ventilating, cow ventilating. Three-part window as an example with lower so light ventilation and view is carried out. 22 lakh liter water harvested in terms of open pond, in terms of these takas, the underground cistern, in terms of, uh, you know, percolating well, as well as recycled uh, waste uh, through root zone. And that waste with the natural plant material and pebble all below ground gives you after 40 days a water clean enough to flush in the tank or to use for gardening without coming in touch with the hand. And then biogas, half of the toilet even today produces gas after 16 years. And of course, the solar active application without battery used since then. Now, multiple use of space, very austere. You know, this was on Gandhian principle. So even if there are participants coming for workshop, they have to share and care. So it's a dormitory rather than individual room. Uh, until the government officers demanded, few rooms have been only made air conditioned, as well, the whole the campus is now the kitchen. Multiple use of space, so outdoor being used as well as living space rather than having to build more and more. There's no space which can accommodate more than 150 or 200 people, and still this campus has had an activity of 2,000 people including during the so-called inauguration, Dr. Abdul Kalam's time, there were thousands of people here. So, oh, then the settlement, uh, that uh, this was post-earthquake rehabilitation, people still lived in the harsh condition with self-esteem and Khamir, and their environment, what they created, had tremendous synergy or reflection of their culture, their craft, their art, their way of life and architecture. And, uh, after the kind of intervention, not only the built form with the local material was created, but there was also this kind of a water, which was, um, the low lying area was selected for dredging. From there, the soil blocks were created and that block uh, created the round bhungas, the houses. But uh, with that depression, with three inch of rainfall that season and clay strata, it became a reservoir. And with reservoir, the ecology of the place changed. So you got this agriculture also happening in the middle of desert and you can see culturally and otherwise in the lives of people what water means you know and even their craft was promoted so this is beyond the building all that that took place this also got the united nations habitat award and this was all done through user participation so youngest generation learned from the oldest and kind of created this architecture so that know-how is transferred this one is cooler in summer, so climatically appropriate using local material, no environmental damage. In fact, it has improved. And in terms of newer things, so it was not just replicating the old, but they did not have this water body. They did not have certain facilities. There was no door-to-door -door sanitation which was introduced. There was, in fact, in one room, a solar panel was put in. So at least in a decentralized way, one room can be illuminated. And there were workshops and other things. So there economic activity can in fact benefit better and there was also a lot of software in terms of that you know designer went there marketing people went there interacted with the community with the help of that NGO and then their products were created in a way that they found wider market with traditional skills and finally the scale of a memorial this one is for Cadilla Pharma it's still not publicly open hopefully in six months it would be and I invite you all to just check it out. Uh, all things are done. It's a memorial of a very uh, handsome uh, 
kind of investment on a personal uh, kind of a family kind of a thing but we took it to become a public kind of thing so how can memorial inform involve and inspire so there is no statue of for the person who it's done it's for uh, mr indravardhan bhai modi the founder of kerala pharma but uh, then this is exactly on the left hand side the point where there is a akhand divo the fire and that one is the point at which he was cremated actually the same point so this this di- duality of water and fire then modera like kun just to sit and meditate because they said we don't want to create a kind of a you know samadhi or so we just want to celebrate his life and inspire barrier free ramps on the axis i want to explain but using natural materials the water you know the five elements and the the wind with aroma and the uh, you know kind of a space between vegetation the velocity of that water in different forms the sliding water the flowing water the tranquil water the fountain sort uh, and same recycled of course and even some coming from the factories uh, waste uh, then reproducible and these are herbal plantation as well as that works for religious uh, connotation as well so in the virgin land this 120 plant species have been planted in the central area 87 and then the patronage to the craft uh, unfortunately fortnight ago padma vibhushan artist from orissa mr mohapatra passed away he did this and they also have a meaning these are all 87 shlokas to commemorate 87 years of the life of the founder and he was proponent i mean he was very much an ardent fan of bhagavad gita so these are all handcrafted and part cnc a uh, resolution like a temple circumambulation of uh, the stamba which each one speaks of the shlok from bhagavad gita to take away back home the message based and in different time the mood changes this are natural so from jungle to man made because that's what he had done to carve a sort of a space for himself even the building for exhibit is as you can see buried entirely below ground so uh, and this overviews were taken from the same very place you can climb up uh, so the point is that these were different scales in you know kind of demonstration of some bit of the concerns uh, uh, that was uh, shared earlier you may or may not uh, want to uh, accept the resolution but i think those concerns it was simply to say that these can be demonstrated you know so we need to know what after a century or so we are at there is a technology definitely which can help like which brought people and families are far together with a landline phone but today on a same dining table each one is in their own different space it one technology was a time was when we used to chain a dog and now we chain ourselves there we also had our own whatsapps cctvs and surfing so the point is that with the uh, you know kind of a correct concern and with the design we can change the world we can improve the quality of life that should be the goal and what we might have to do to do that is to in fact rather than giving gandhian currency the value we might have to make gandhian value itself the currency you know there is a difference between glamour and beauty one changes now and then is temporal and can lose its sheen like a fashion over time while beauty is integral and therefore remains timeless and i believe as a kind of a you know obligation of the building being lasting beyond us we need to look for timeless beauty sustainable uh, environmentally as well as appropriate culturally so welcome to traverse in the immensity of time and space and notion and reality of this place and the kind of uh, lesson for this is inspire for yesterday and aspire for tomorrow tradition in india has continued from yesterday as our present because it has constantly updated itself to the present but it has maintained the dna where it came from from the past so for us history is not a kind of grandmother's nostalgia 
Uh, sorry, history may be a kind of forgotten past, but tradition is not the grandmother's nostalgia or the embalmed yesterday. So tradition is a living history, while history may have been a dead tradition. So with that, I think if we can learn from the wisdom, accumulated wisdom of 6,500 years, we can reshape because many of those values the pandemic taught us about being with family, about, uh, you know, compact things, about uh, frugality, about plurality, about equality. And the whole world was humbled that technology may be a tool, but we are not becoming a master with that. We can still be a microsystem of a larger cosmos. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for giving me this platform. Thank you so much, sir, for this insightful presentation. I think it was lovely. And uh, there are certain questions from the audience which we would Please. like you to answer. Uh, so the first question is, why high-rise buildings, say around 30 to 40 stories, are always covered with glass rather than using jollies for natural air circulation? Okay, so I'm glad this question has come up because I'll go... First thing first, you said why high rise, and then you were talking about glass versus jolly. I would say why mm -hmm. high rise. You know, the one that I showed you that, and what is relevant to context, that's why I'm saying that poor houses could get 2.7 FSI. We have seen, and it's simple kind of a, you know, logic that if you have 60% on the ground, 50% on the first floor, 40%, and likewise you go on for five floors, you get 1.8 FSI or more. Uh, and this is every floor getting compulsorily 10 percent terrace and yet you can get that fsi while till recently you were getting kind of 1.8 as a maximum fsi then you could buy some quarter so you made it 2.25 so what i'm saying is that till the threshold you don't necessarily have to assume that high rise is uh, low rise is not high density you know most of the even Agraharam to whatever of our traditional quarter have been fantastically good density, you know. So you need to decide when to go high rise. When I say when, for which user group, because let's not fool ourselves. High rise is more energy intensive. High rise is more demanding and 100% high rise is more expensive. So if you think high rise is cheap, no, it's a chicken and the age, egg kind of a cycle. More FSI you give on a piece of land, the value of that land increases. So you're back to square one. You know, if there was 1.5 FSI, that land would be as expensive. I mean, X expensive versus if there is a 30 floor, you know, or unlimited FSI, people would give 10 times more to that land. And then you would say, oh, how can you afford this? You know, so actually one has to control the land price by this distribution of uh, FSI, not uniform everywhere. And that has to actually depend on the carrying capacity. And culturally, it's a disaster because you don't know your neighbor on the above floor. He might be like your, uh, you know, enemy. But coming to that, there is a kind of a pressure difference after certain limit, not, I think, till 10 floors or so, where the air gets thinner and air particularly, you might have velocity or so. So just jali may or may not be appropriate after some height, but you can have that three-part window. That's definitely a great answer, which we had in the traditional houses. So top one can be just good for afternoon ventilation, middle one when we are ready to gossip and for view, and the lower one when you're asleep, just a kind of flow of air coming or cold air coming from there. So point is not about what that... Everybody is a better designer than me to arrive at, but a control to you to manipulate like Thali at your instance, when, why, how. Okay, so what activity, what gradient of privacy, what time of the day, etc. So if you have that control, most of these right now, what happens is two o'clock afternoon with Raymond nylon kind of a suite, we want comfort in the indoors packed unit okay then only air conditioner can give us but even in the, we under we understand this very well that most of our sites when we go to there is no air conditioned cabin that we have most of our at least our contractor can't afford it uh, so when you sit under a tree even in may afternoon two o'clock 
it doesn't become so much uncomfortable, unbearable because of the breeze that goes in there. So even in a high rise, you don't shut out this. So second point was that more manipulability rather than the fixed something. And third is that glass per se is not one is against, but if you use even the glass, one meter awning as a protective element can reduce 70% of that radiation. So why not do that rather than rely on a doubly glazed, very fancy and expensive glass, which can only come down to about 35-40% of reduction. So that's the point. Thank you so much. This was a good answer. And I think uh, this would even answer part of the second question that I have, which uh, someone asked that, uh, what is the ideal approach for aesthetic purpose to develop a city, like horizontally or vertically? I would not use aesthetic is the last thing because it should be one of the criteria for architect very important. People come to you for that. But you must understand like a doctor, you have to first diagnose what is right for the context. And in that culturally, climatically, functionally, affordably, and therefore eventually aesthetically, I think it's the low rise but high density. And tourism all over the world is essentially for this. For example, even Petronas Tower has lost its kind of meaning when something more taller has come about. Who goes to Empire State Building today, which was once a landmark? But that's the point about the fashion that Ashkal Fog Chal Rai, now Bell Bottom is in fashion, but tomorrow Nero would come in. So it will keep changing. But in that sense, the sari would last forever. True. And uh, I have another last Because question. it's also human that you can perceive. How many fools like me have asked question in New York, standing in front of Empire State Building, excuse me, sir, where is Empire State Building? And the guy would say, "You, gentlemen, you're just standing right in front. Because we know a lot of these high rises through that cap and the crown. And when you are at the ground level, that cone of vision is gone. Okay, so for many reasons, uh, same thing in Singapore. Let's not only bit I mean, think uh, because when we talk of India, people we think we are regressing. But Singapore, Singapore used to have that perimeter block in a Chinatown or whatever, and that had a same density or more than the isolated needles. And you know, it was a fisherman's village, and uh, people started find, discovering that as a very virgin place. And people started going there and just around the same time as ours, a little later, it became independent. Uh, I don't know, 60s maybe. Uh, and uh, then when they got the riches because it became a popular destination for conventions, they started investing in high rises and steel class facade buildings and downtowns of anywhere likewise. And in 97, I was first and in that seminar and one scholar had done a research and he shared this information that tourism of Singapore around then declined very sharply. It nosedived. And that was the major bread earner for the country, revenue generator, tourism. And they ran an analysis and they found the culprit was that Singapore had lost its ethnicity, its asmita. It could be anywhere in the world then. Earlier it had its own character of being an island next to water, a kind of little uh, uh, sort of a robust and stuff like that. You know, like today, who goes to Mustafa Mall as an attraction? Okay, as not as an attraction to go. Yes, you might shop anywhere. Likewise, so they overnight, being a dictatorial state, reinstated the policies where these Chinatowns won't be demolished. They would turn into alternative uses of housing the people as a pension, as a boutique and stuff like that. Okay? So that was the form of uh, new use that it was put into. And they started bringing back what was unique character of Singapore, including on the tourism brochure, they said melting part of diverse culture and on that brochure was the Tamil temple Shikhara put in there in Singapore. 
Okay, so they started realizing that what is their resource and virtue. They started developing waterfronts uh, as a kind of unique character. They started investing in a street-based life. So they kind of uh, kind of restructured the interfaces of the street to have cafes and all like Europe. Okay. So not like Europe has to imitate, but their thing was about outdoors. So we understand how a cafe, Oxide Cafe of Europe becomes the life of the street. Same way they tried to bring those back, you know. And once again, I think it brought in interest of others. Otherwise, those concrete pagodas and tall monoliths didn't kind of excite people to go there. Thank you so much for this answer. We have another question, can we ask? Um, yes. What is the latest concept that you got to know of vernacular or sustainable architecture? It's not, I mean, see, many principles are applied in, see, when you say vernacular, it's not a formula. As I said, it's a principle and that is very uniquely and diversely applied to many places, but one of which that can very uh, creatively be adapted in present times is uh, that double skin idea, you know. So, uh, for example, in a Hyderabad, that uh, park hotel using parametric design and kind of puncturing the external screen, it created a screen out of that. Uh, but the nice thing was the logic, the parametrics that it said that, okay, if you're on a ground floor, it's more a public amenity and what kind of visibility and punctures do you need that at the same time, how would sun affect that versus the middle floors versus the top floors. So the angle of the, you know, cut as well as the, similarly at eye level, you want to look out, but at the other point, the holes can be more, uh, less denser and more kind of opaque. And likewise, and that created a very kind of uh, random, but program using technology, but coming to the answers of that jolly kind of a situation in a very present time. So it's a principles how you use uh, in, in our building also. I showed stainless steel jolly. Of course, it, stainless steel has a very different meaning. I would not boast about it, but that other one on the south uh, was uh, one where even present day laser cutting, but the board size versus the, uh, you know, this or how thick that material should be versus how small the hole should be. And those principles understood, you can apply them today more meaningfully and more so than even before. Like often people ask in high rises, how do you think about this recycle? It's not point about what you recycle, but in a high rise where Concrete frame might be taking the burden. All your internal partitions can be of a recycled material. Rather than that slum center that I told where it was still participating in load sharing. It was not a concrete frame building. So concrete frame building, it's only infill. Even a paper can do the job. So there's nothing about it that can't be used. Uh, you know, and all these are present day. That's why... Uh, I always uh, kind of use some examples to only be able to demonstrate that this is not just an idealist kind of uh, place uh, thinking or can be only applied for the poor. Actually, Antilia should have been the greatest of case study for every school in the world. But I don't know which mm -hmm. textbook we refer to or is it referable? Okay, thank you so much. And I have one more last question. Uh, what is the importance of making students aware of the documentation of historical places in India? Yes, uh, as I say, don't take history as history. First of all, they're part of us, you know, for three reasons, you look at history, but in our case, that has become tradition because that is still there. Three performance reason. Absolutely no romance, no nostalgia, no family album from the past. First is they have been timeless because like if you take today's, uh, one of my favorite is the step well, six century old structure. But even today, if it inspires awe and tourists come there, there's no functional value anymore to that. 
although there is a water, but nobody uses that. Still people go there. It is not a temple per se, and still people regard it as a sacred place and so on and so forth. It is entirely the pull of the space. So can we not learn those principles, which is what I did to interpret the historic example, to learn about its principle of space making, which even today, if I do it even in concrete and glass, can I not apply that, uh, you know? So one is for its timelessness. So study and document historic building, not as an object, not to measure that it was nine inch or what, but to understand the principle of why we like it. What of this assembly of elements and not only like it, but how does it narrate itself without a guide? How does it say, come here, like in Stepwell, it invites you with the two outcrop of stone. Then the steps, even to go down, there are steps to climb up. So it unveiled, it, it concealed the view before. And then you take first step and now you can unveil what is coming. And that is why it's curious, engaging and kind of all the time enthralling sort of a journey. So can't these principles be used today? So that is one reason. And that is how this should be studied. You know, not as dates that who built it, you know, was it Akbar or Barbal or... Uh, you know, Ashoka or so and so forth. But history more seen in its relevance of principles for timeless aesthetic. Second, you see it for its sociocultural appropriate, so appropriateness. So never document or study historic building in isolation as an object. Understand them vis-a-vis -vis the settlement vis-a-vis -vis the life of people, vis-a-vis -vis the climate of the place, vis-a-vis -vis the material base of the thing. For example, not only you, we all know the lifestyle of Bunga and all, so I'm not going on that, but one small detail that they use the khip grass. Khip is the kind of uh, grass that grows in a desert condition. And that grass also coming from desert condition that it is not coming at a very sparse interval, okay? So, the, and not is the place where the thing would rot because that's where there will be moisture that will be no hard cover, disintegrate. So, keep grasses, grass, roof, thatch roof would last for a good 12, 13 years. And same place, when we did the earthquake thing, we couldn't find that much quantity of that immediately in the vicinity. And we used to use Jawar grass and they already said, okay, we can use Jawar grass in the scarcity, but Jawar grass would decompose and uh, kind of uh, degenerate in three to four years. Every three, four years, we'll have to change it. So see how much minute things it is about that to learn from, you know. But if you then just make a circular drum as a thing to learn from. So second for socio-cultural appropriateness, how did it fit in the context? And and mind you, as much we might think we have changed as a human species and as an Indian, I don't think culturally we have changed so much. As much modern a family, but when his daughter goes out on a date with her black boy the first time, he shivers in his pants. Okay? Third thing is, uh, and that is why, you know, when we have this habit of smoking, a simple gods and goddesses icon or drawn swastik does the wonders in checking that because we still think swastik is sacred and you can't spit on it. You know, So cultural appropriateness. And third reason you should understand the old document uh, or when document the monuments or historic buildings with is the concern for environmental management. Because as I said, they were pre-electricity time. And yet if they feel cool and comfortable, what are those principles? It's a whole system. If courtyard does not have an inlet which comes from the cool place, an inlet has to be smaller and therefore it's jolly. And that comes from the shaded street. It would not work. If I close the courtyard from top, the air would not, the system of air would not work. So if I understand them from, so these three performance standard and fourth, of course, if you want to feel interested and you want to apply that, then the construction technique. Trust me, yesterday only XYZ faith doing a temple in XYZ warm place and they're trying bit because there's an international architect there by law and they tried cement this, this, that, but in that heat, 
it would this it would crack so some gentleman called me just to ask for a reference that uh, what is required to be done and they found that traditional architecture had an answer to that even as a construction technique today today's technology okay and somebody's reference is given and they think they would find answer there because they did go to that country's vernacular place and they saw that several centuries that is working why is today's thing not working so it's not giving gali to today but it's saying that we are going to be smart if we take advantage of the resource you know alphabet a to z are invented why do you have to invent new carry on from z to omega and theta and whatever beyond okay, okay. so for yes. these reasons and for these intentions if we teach as well as document and we need to document because these buildings for n number of reasons largely political and commercial get erased from our memory getting erased from our memory so at least it can be preserved is through documentation okay Thank that's you. why we have started many decades ago louis tan trophy for documentation from vastu chin thank Foundation. you so much okay. yes that answers very well thank you so much this was the last question for today's thank session you. thank you all thank you it for it was giving. lovely having you yeah. thank you so much <laughs> and seeing at least through this medium and sharing these thoughts it's not preaching but discussing amongst the professionals and uh, stay safe and stay positive in this time stay together bye bye thank you